I'm good morning. Good morning. Let's get back to this subject, you know. Yeah. Not where you go, like I told you. It's not a subject I like, but you got to go through it because it did happen, and that's all there is to it, okay? Yeah. And in fact, the civilizations, plural, that we have created in this continent would not have happened without this. That's, that's the truth, not an opinion. Okay, we <clears throat> left somewhere in here the last time, and I hope we can get through this time. If not, it, we'll uh, have to pick it up by the next term, okay? It's a long subject, okay? Uh, I believe we left it here, and it is there. Slavery and the ownership of slavery are accepted by Christian kings and people. Uh, the church, you know, I said <clears throat> that it encouraged man and mission. They set them free, you get money and you free the slave, and you gain merit. So when you go out in heaven, they'll say, oh yeah, you, you, you use man and mission. But that's, just, that's the way it was, okay? And uh, we don't have to go if we go just the last century, we have this character, uh, which we know very well, and <clears throat> J.C. Calhoun. He was vice president twice, and one with Andy Jackson. Those two together must have been a show. The <clears throat> Calhoun began rigid defense of Southern beliefs and practices. I use him as an example, but he was by no means the only one, okay? His concept of Republican I mean, for that approval of his slavery and minorities. The place wouldn't work without the slaves. Slavery, that rather than being necessary, <coughs> that's when the South, they said <coughs> all the time, it was possibly good, benefiting both slave and slave owners. I would have loved to shift put him as a slave and see how he got benefited on him, but you can't change history. Okay, that happened. Okay. And then there is this bird, James Shorter. I presume that is a <clears throat> Yankee uniform, because he was, a, he was, his alma mater was Harvard and became a professor of law there, uh, very learned, and uh, had several books written, very active, and that's just a sampler. The guy read, <clears throat> did do a lot of work on the law, various aspects, the Constitution, personal property, and so on, all right? So I'm showing it because this is one of the select group of, uh, that we had. Legal treatises, other books. Most important, History of the United States under the Constitution. This is a major work. Why am I showing this? Because it was a typical of a learned person of the period. You know, that's... And then he wrote this. With all this knowledge that he must have known a lot, you know, well, he wrote that, okay? About the Negro, okay? And then he was servile, racist, stupid, brutish, obedient to the whip, children of the imagination, and so forth and so on, okay? He didn't know his history. North American slave rebellion in Mexico. From the beginning, from the very beginning, boom, in New Spain, Mexico. San Miguel de Guadalupe, slaves, rebel, revolt. And then the Bayano War, 1548. And in 1570, Gaspar Jan got revolt. That was a big one, okay. They were suppressed, but the spirit was there. And they weren't accepting, weren't servile and brutish and so on. They knew exactly what was being done to them, or at least had leaders who knew. The U.S., where do we begin? About 1663, and this, and that, and that, and that, and that. And he goes on. Okay. 
Then, 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 then. One after the other after the other. The slaves did revolt and they tried. Some, most of them were not successful, but some of them were successful enough to get some changes in their position or how they were treated and so forth. Okay. This happened to us. This is the United States of America. This happened here. It goes on. This one has been really is not one of the one of the great biggest one. And in fact as as I looked into these very rebellions, this is kind of an ordinary one, but it has been given publicity and movies have been made and so on. Nat Turner. Okay. This belief, this attitude of races, that some races were better than others, that some were brutish and so forth, this persisted. Mind you, we fought a civil war okay, on the subject, but it still persisted and done a lot of political damage. And, uh, okay, shift back to Spain. What was happening there? Spain among the, the powers, why I said the powers, the European powers, had a lot more to do with the future of the Americas than anybody else. Okay. So what was happening there? I already covered the invasion of Muslims into Spain. That had a tremendous effect, I will show you, on how, <clears throat> on the slavery and the concept that goes with it. 1492, you had the crown of Castile, the crown of Aragon, this, all right? That confluent and became two crowns, Castile, the crown of Aragon and the Nazarite kingdom of Granada. Okay. That's the crown of Aragon. They extended all the way to Sicily, Naples, Sardinia, the Balearic Islands. It was very powerful, militarily and in money. And this was Castile, which in a way was not as powerful, except militarily. So that was it. So why am I showing this? Siege of Granada. Because there were consequences to this war. Remember I told you about Al Andos, how nice it was, you know, that Christians and Muslims were working together. There was another view or political position, Christian against Muslim, Muslim against that existed in the upper structure of the governments, okay? Huh? This is Muslim work. It did very, very good. Incredible. There were no slaves. There were no slaves. These people worked for pay and were recognized by their Today they would fit very nice and probably make a lot of money doing things like that, okay? But the old change on January 2nd, 1492, that is when Granada surrendered, <coughs> was taken by the Castilian armies. Okay, watch this. India, the Castilian conquest, uh, provided the Christian king with southern extensions of land. As they would succeed, they would take land. What to do with land? The land belonged to the crown, okay? And the crown parcel it out. Uh, if you were successful in acquiring land, okay, that land would be granted to you, okay, along with the people who lived there who work as serfs. 
Nothing new here because Northern Europe was doing the same thing. The serf worked for, for the noblemen. Okay. The gifts finished the traditional small land, social class, typical of our landlords. If there were, say, for example, and I'm guessing, uh, 15, 20 farms, a landless style, which would be somewhere between 500 acres to 1,000 acres, the guy who conquered the whole territory would be granted all the land, and that would become a, an old latifundio, which morph into hacienda, facenda, and so forth. Keep that in mind. So this changes now. Until relatively recent in southern Spain, and even to some degree in Portugal, there were large, very large uh, farms, enterprises, and it was a class of people, the Hornalero. Uh, they didn't have anything. And all they did, they waited for harvest when the olives had to be baked up, or the grapes had to be baked up, or uh, maybe even rice or barley. I mean, yes, rice or barley had to be collected. These people then would hire for the season. All right. Well, this automatically created a class that didn't exist before on the model. So it can be argued that the resurgence of this latifundia in Spain and other places spawned economic basis of the European feudal system. And the material is there, it's available. There are documents and so on that you can, you can see taxes collected and all that kind of thing. It is available. Ship over across the Atlantic. This applies to modern colonial period. Now the European market often rewarded services the same way. They would grant extensive lands to some nobleman, usually for the same reason they were successful militarily or maybe politically, whatever. They would grant these huge things. So you got a nobility class, okay? Forced recruitment of local allowed by colonial made land grant particularly lucrative. Yeah, if you get this land and you get the Indians that go with it, okay, wow, you got cheap land, you're going, okay? Plantation. Uh, when you said Indians there, who are you talking about? No, I'm, I'm across the Atlantic now, I'm oh, sorry. I'm across. See, I use that, I'm sorry, I, I wasn't. Uh, I was talking to what was going on in Europe, and so let's cross the Atlantic and see how these ideas were transferred exactly almost to. So there wasn't anything new, it was just the way things were done. Mm -hmm. Except that the Indians didn't know about this. <laughs> so in Spain, there were, the local laborers were paid. Yes. They got wages. But yeah. In the New World, they did not. Mm. Let's go into that. It's like okay. a, um, so what we had in, there were all these people captured, the Indians and so on. So what to do with them? Okay. That became a problem. Because never before had such numbers of people unrelated to Europe, totally unrelated to Europe, being in the possession of European powers. So they had then hacienda, plante, highly stratified social system. And I'm gonna go a little into that. Okay. So if we look, say, through the 19th century, or even through the last half of the 18th century, you begin to see why the problems that we've had in Latin America here to uh, evolve. And they're based on this. Now, if you're wild, like me, 
It is related all the way back to the Roman Latifundia. This has been kept. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> okay. Remember I showed you this? When Columbus saw the Indians there, he made this observation. It would be nice to enslave them, easy to make them work for us. And I said that Doña Isabel was not pleased with that. She was very religious. She saw in this people more subjects, more Christians, Catholics. Okay. She, Spain was born in Valladolid on October the 18th, 1469, when these two married. And that's why I'd show you the maps of Castile and the maps of Aragon. Huge amount, huge amount of power came together. And this is where they married. And this is by Adolí, okay? So if you're a conservative, okay, there is no more conservative place in Spain than by Adolí, Spain. This is it, you know, this is where they, okay. Grandson. By then, what to do with the Indians have become a real problem. Okay, uh, hundreds of thousands. Okay, of people captured or that had uh, were in the land that was there, but they had no papers. They had nothing that a European accept as proof of property. So what to do with it? Huh? Well, he's bothered by that. And I gave you a handout on this. He said, this needs to be debated. This needs to be uh, looked into from religious, from moral grounds, etc. and it needs to be done properly. Okay. So where, where do they do this? In Bayern the very center of what Spain was, okay? The most important place, the most refined place by Italy, as far as intellectual uh, capacity. So he says, he instructs two people to inquire into the development of the foreign laws and preach holy Catholic faith in the new world. If we're gonna do that, do we have the right to do it? How are we gonna do it? to examine how those people may be subjected without damage of our conscience. You know, it's an, it had to be according to what we believe in, you know, you know with the Catholic Church. Two people, De Las Casas and Sepulveda. I'm not going to go into all of these details, but they did go at each other. Very fine minds and very knowledgeable in the matters of uh, morals, in the matters of laws, politics, very, very knowledgeable. So this was no light, lightweight and there was no attempt at covering up or anything, just say it like it is and we will see what conclusions you come to. The first moral debate in European history. I don't say the first. I say the only one of this, of this character and of this importance that was ever held in Europe. I wish they had had it. Maybe they would have avoided some big wars, okay, later. Anyway. Sepulveda, of course, he immediately latched in what the Aztecs and even the Mayas were doing and even the Incas were doing, taking babies up to freeze in the Andes as sacrifices, and he latched on that. And his arguments, a lot here, that these people are barbaric. They have nothing of intellectual value, they never produce anything, they're not likely to produce anything, we cannot treat them like they were, were the Spaniards. That was his position. Of course he had reports that they'd be, the Aztec had been butchering people and the, so, 
to a very Catholic uh, primate. They would take a very jaundiced eye, but there was an argument he used. There is no evidence here uh, that the Indians must accept the Spanish joke because it's their best way to protect them. It's for them to convert. And for them, the crown would protect them against other Indians or even against themselves. That once this region has been brought to control, the gospel of Christ can be preached by consecrated men safely without danger. The powerful argument. Put yourself in the position of that time. This is a very good argument. But then Las Casas. Sepulveda never was in the Americas. Never visited. This is contrary to Las Casas. Las Casas had been visiting through the Caribbean, had been in Mexico. He was very knowledgeable of what the Indians were and who they were. Okay. So he says, it is unlawful. If you cons his position, if you consider them material to become Christians like us, then it is unlawful for you to force the Indian to the faith by war, using war. They, for the faith in which if you, if you are going to subjugate him, then it should be done the same way you do to your own. Okay? And that is not what Sepulveda, you see, he's now treating them, no, no, they're like us. They're not any different. Okay, the kings are to have their point, leading the Indians to the faith. Christ's glory and the truth of the gospel. War is not a suitable means for spreading Christ's glory and the truth of the gospel. That's was his position. The others said no, because Sepulveda said no, because these are savages. They don't have anything that we should respect. And in the final, the kings of Castile can neither directly nor indirectly do anything that is opposed to the spiritual or even temporal development of those people. This picture of somebody here in Melbourne taking on, taking on a, one of the types of presidents that we and taking them on like that. It said that anyone who understands the words of the law and then works against the will of the law violates the law. Um, so he said, this is the law. And now you propose to violate the law. You know the law. Okay. All right. In the end, it did good. The Indians were recognized as equal to other subjects of the crown. They were to be treated in the same manner as other subjects. Okay. They were to be converted to Christianity on their own, aided by priests and other religious people. All right. This was not enacted completely, but it was to a degree. When they landed, the conquerors could chop the head out of anybody. That's it. Nothing. No, they couldn't. Because you, you had actually acted against a potential subject of the crown. That was heavy. Couldn't get you home. Black African slaves were proposed as good labor substitutes for the Indians. <clears throat> Las Casas have been accused of that, but now you're using 21st century judgment. Okay. All the way back to Aristotle is when he said that people are divided on those who rule and those that are ruled. He just, he just the blacks in Africa as an example of non-humans. And this, this day, so they weren't even mentioned in all of this Okay. That was the 16th century. What, what about us in the 19th century, before the Civil War? You have the Three-Fifth Amendment 
I'll reduce it to you very quickly. If you had a hundred slaves, okay, you had, and there were elections, you had your own vote, of course, good citizen, and then you had 60 other votes, three-fifths of your 100 slaves. So each slave was worth three-fifths of a vote. If you want power, if you want power, that's it. And you have to remember that at that time, because of cotton and the export of cotton and the value that cotton had to the nation, to the republic then, uh, this was allowed, aided and abetted by the planters, cotton plants. But we did this. Okay. Of course, after the Civil War, forget it. Okay. Get back to the encomienda system. What to do with the Indians, okay? When I'm repeating here, excuse me. When the Spanish conquered the natives in the Caribbean and South America, these natives were required to pay tribute or perform work for the Spanish landowners. Was that new? No. The Incas did the same thing. They had to pay with work, what they called the MITA, M-I-T-A. This was before the Spanish. Everything that you see today, those <coughs> wonderful, for the period, uh, paths and tracks and highways through the Andes that were built by the Incas, was built with MITA, that is, with surf work. The French also had it. They call it the corvée, and it was so many days a year, you had to pay not with money, but labor, okay? This is one of the reasons for the French Revolution, among many. But the encomienda approach summarizes system used by the Spanish and the Portuguese too. Gave the owner of the land the right to enslave native people. When you reduce it, that's what it was. On the condition that then the landowner would convert the natives to Christianity. Okay, That's, that was the uh, moralizing statement. Well, don't worry about it because you're not, we're going to get Christians out of this. Uh, cheap labor. So that made possible and I'll cover that when we go through sugar cane and so forth, made possible the large, very large <coughs> lands in the haciendas and so forth. <clears throat> Some of these look good. When you look at French, well, they look good. But then there's the practical. It took sometimes over a month and a half to ship a messenger to Spain and another month and a half to come back. So practically, how was this to be enforced when the distances were so large? And we started with this medieval social system. And what this in danger was this. I already showed you this. This is conversion. You got the peninsulares, uh, the Spaniards at the top, they're the king, okay? Then you have the Creoles. Those are white born and raised in the Americas. They were not accepted as equal to the Spaniards born and raised in Spain. Okay? So it was sort of a nobility type thing. Then there were mestizos, African European blood. Then <coughs> mulattoes, then there were Sambos, Indians, and Africans. And they had all kinds, and this is but one classification. They were very, very uh, precise on who you were on the basis of where your family came from. Why was that important? Money. Some pay less taxes than the others. Okay. 
some had more access to land than the others. That was all behind it. Here. This is from Peru, what they call a casta. Cast, cast. And you had all kinds of definitions. You see, it says here, is Spanish was Jew, that is mestizo. Okay. It says here, uh, <coughs> mestiza was the Spanish. Okay, he has a glass. And then it says, castizo was Spanish. That becomes a Spaniard. So, so they, they will classify you like that. And the laws, there were laws applying to each of the castas. This went on for 200 some years. Some terms have gotten into English. You hear about quadroon, octoroon, okay. and uh, that's part of this casta system. A quadroon or a port, quarteron in Spanish was a person with one quarter African and the rest, you know, Spanish. Or it could be one eighth. Now, when it was one sixteenth, I read you were out. You were okay. Okay, you're okay. So you had to be three or four generations before they cleaned you up. Okay, this went on. You think it's the Spanish alone? Here's the French system. Exactly the same thing. And you got in Saint Domingue and in Guadeloupe, and they had all the seven, eight, three, eight, nine, nine, and they had a classification for you. What I find interesting is Saint-Domingue was different from Guadalupe and Martinique. Probably had to do with the number of slaves available or whatever. You know. Here. Okay. You have Thomas Alexander Dumas, a mulatto, was the son of a French nobleman who married or had dalliance or whatever, was a Haitian uh, female, you know, black female. And then, so he was a mulatto, okay? And three generations of this guy, then he engendered Alexander Dumas, the writer, okay? And even, so he was a quadroon. And then even his son, Alexander Dumas Fitz, he was an octoroon. And I put this as an example because you see how complicated it grows? Because it takes this guy, who was a fantastic military man. Okay. Napoleon loved him. I get back with it. I've already shown you how, before the Americas, how limited world trade was compared to today. Empires, kingdoms, slave spots, was all over Africa. And when you read, when you read histories and reports of the time, sometimes they tell you, there was very good business and so on. Keep in mind that the best, the best materials that you could get from there were slaves. It wasn't gold or silver, it was slaves. So then when down the slaving for the purpose of, uh, certainly in the case of Portugal, Spain was different, we'll see. And this went on. Even from before Roman times, there was all this thing of going down, capturing some slaves, coming, bringing them up to the Mediterranean, into the slave markets, and sell them. I already touched on that in the last lecture, okay? And the Portuguese went on on that basis, and I'll get, get to more details in the next lecture, okay? But the merchandise, 
the main one was the capture of slaves, because it was very profitable. Slaves were brought across the Atlantic. Most of them for Portuguese from Angola, and then they would go down to Rio La Plata and sell them to the Spanish miners in the Andes where they had silver and gold mines. So okay. Even today, you, I've never been in Nigeria. I wish I, I had gone, but it's, I don't think I'm gonna go. Okay, you can see the, in Cuba, where I was raised as a teenager, there was the Yoruba. The main slaves that were brought were captured here in the Gulf of Skinny, and they were Yorubas. The Yorubas still exist in Nigeria. And then the Igbos, they had the slaves classified uh, according to their docility. And some, you never saw Zulus. Nobody brought Zulus, okay? With one exception, I'll go into it. Here, Nigeria, this, this area here, they would come and get the slaves and bring them back to either through the Sahara directly or when the Portuguese and came, would bring them back to uh, Lisbon for sale. And the Spanish would buy from them. The Spanish never, actually, never got involved in the actually trade, slave trade. They had gold and silver. So why go through all of that? Portuguese would sell it to them. You've seen these things. It was by no, about two or three years ago. It's what I call an empathy, a journey of empathy. Okay. This rebellion, in a way, succeeded. It was a ship that was just north of Cuba. And the slaves revolted and succeeded. And then they landed over in the US and you got to see the movie. It's a very good movie. What do we do with this? Do we have jurisdiction over them? So forth. It is slave market. Could have been New Orleans, could have been Charlton. That was typical. Okay. <clears throat> My beloved British. Okay. So in 1808, no more slave, okay, slavery, okay. So you can't trade, you can't go down. The English ship cannot go down. That's a slave ship and capture and do what the Portuguese were doing. They can't do that, okay. And they actually set up a naval patrol to see to it that slaving was suppressed. And it, it was somewhat successful, okay. But then it stopped it. I think we better stop here, okay? Oh yeah, okay. Somebody said something, was that you? What? <laughs> they are gonna send me there. To, okay. <clears throat> uh, already mentioned that the Spanish overall didn't get involved in the actual going and capturing the slaves and bringing them. No, no, they would buy them. And they would buy them from the Portuguese and from the English. They would buy them. It was kind of funny because uh, you said, well, how's the silver mines in the Andes? Okay. They had lots of silver and gold. Let's go. But they had mines. So they said, we're not going to get involved in this. Profit wise, it was better to buy the slaves and use them. So I thought I would have some examples. Well, the first thing they, they did was mining. Years ago, I was in Barcelona, and they have a, uh, 
museum there on mineralogy. And it goes way, way back. And they had samples there that were sent in the early 1600s. And it was a marvelous, incredible collection. Uh, so that kind of said, hmm. so that was the game. And emerald and all kinds of things. OK. But Potosi Silver Mine, this was the quintessential one. The Incas had nothing to do with it. This, the Spanish were very good at mineralogy, and it didn't take them long to find <coughs> that that cerro was loaded with silver. And immediately they started exploiting it. Sure. And they call it <coughs> uh, Cerro Rico. Cerro is a hill, a rich hill. That's what they meant, OK? So it's right here. That's, you know, Peru, Bolivia, it's right there. So how were they feeding the, the miners? What? How did they raise enough food to feed the 200,000 people? Well, that was part of the trade. Because you see, the, that's a very good question, because you're going to have to have part of the meta, the tax that they had on the uh, inhabitants of the uh, Inca Empire was in the form of food. They had to bring it in. So that was part of the payment. That all figured out. OK. So that's it. It's still there. See that big hole there? OK. If you were then, this is how you access. It's, it's pretty horrible, OK? So just to get down to where the silver was, was something else. Originally, the natives didn't do well, just the same as it happened in the rest of the Americas. They couldn't take this kind of work. Even though they had been born and raised up in the highlands, they couldn't do it and die like fleas. And they kept replacing them, but that was not enough. So then they started bringing Africans, you know, slaves, who did much better, surprising. And you didn't see that today. There we go. That's, that's the actual mine. You just go through there, and uh, you get to see that. OK. And then you ask, well, what was the light? It was all lamps and all the uh, carbon coming out of them. You can imagine the hellacious mess that was. They developed a cheap process of <coughs> converting the silver mineral to silver. And that's what they call the patio process. Because it's almost like the devil had it. Near this mine, they, they discovered mines for mercury. And then they would mix the material, which is a sulfide, with mercury. The silver is released, and the mercury and whatever else that was there remains. And they would just leave the mercury there and go on. The, for mixing, and you see it here, got the mules over here. That was what's called the patio process. All right. Then they would take the silver over the Andes, OK, down to the Pacific, north to Panama, and from Panama to Acapulco in Mexico, going to the other side, or to Spain. Here is the Acapulco. The trade winds would take them over to Manila. And the only purpose, the Spanish were not interested in the Philippines. It was too far away, except for the Chinese trade. And China was, they loved silver. So the Spanish said, silver we got, lots of it. And you got porcelain. You got Chinese porcelain, and we are very interested in porcelain. So once a year, one or two galleons, that's the name of the ships, pick up the 
silver, take it to Manila, the Chinese merchant would come down and they would exchange and it was extremely profitable because one of the Spanish uh, navigators had discovered in the Pacific kind of paralleling what happens in the southern Atlantic. There is a gyre, and the gyre says the winds go west, and if you go a little north, they'll go back east. So that's called a gyre. And that was a secret, very secret. Rod, the, you showed the bringing, you take the silver over, bring uh, the porcelain back. Yeah. All right? But yeah. then you the probably didn't have a great market in, in that part of the world. For no. Before, they, uh, it, it had to go on to Spain. To there. Europe. But it always went back. Right, right. There. So it was the, uh, that kind of, uh, porcelain was highly esteemed all over and very expensive. Later, uh, the Dutch and then the English later learned how to do an approximate, fairly approximate uh, ceramic, which we still have, but that's the origin of it. But it was tremendously profitable for the Spanish because the silver didn't cost them that much. But the porcelain, they could sell any amount that they could take across the Atlantic back. Okay. So there was the annual Manila Galleon system. And I already showed it to you. Okay. They actually spent so much silver in Europe, not only with the porcelain, but also with these stupid wars against the Protestants and so on. All that silver went to Europe and disappeared. Nothing was left in Spain except uh, maybe a few ceramics and things like that. It, it's, that's what is really ironic. See the equatorial cord? And they go back. And this went on. Galleons were huge for the time. Very, very large, slow ships. But that meant that you had to guard them. So you had to have X number of uh, naval, military ships, fast frigates, so that they would be around the galleon protecting them all the way from untold pirates and uh, Dutch. Okay. But even then, see, even then, you say, well, the Spanish work, good navigators, yeah, some were, but they didn't have enough men, you know, sailors. But if you got money, you get sailors. And they were getting Chinese sailors, okay? Very good. And you have to protect them. Go up to Japan, and you get run-ins. So if you attacked a Spanish galleon, you were all of a sudden facing some very efficient mad Japanese samurais. They are the samurais that were not attached to a sovereign or a master. They were free, and they called ronins. Okay. So they were for hire. In so far as the Spanish sailors, very few officers, navigators, so forth. Here's one of those uh, artist conceptions. One went on in Manila. And it started to say that the Spanish really, really never were too interested, like the Dutch were in Indonesia. The Spanish didn't, they were not interested too far. And then you have to have all this, this stuff. The Dutch were coming in, later the English. And we don't need that. Okay, so then only one island, and I've been there, in the Philippines speaks the Spanish, actually perfect. And that's the island of Cebu, Cebu. Okay. You could say that the galleon was an important early stage development of globalized mark. This is a globalized mark. You got Japan, you got China, you got 
presumably some native Filipinos. Then you got the Spanish in New Spain, in Mexico, down in. So it's a huge system, and it worked. <clears throat> I got this from some Filipino history in this. I don't know Tagalog. I don't know Tagalog, but they said they got words like uh, chili, chili, in all chocolate, chocolate that were came out of all this trading, and of course they they would get chocolate and chilies and stuff like that too, you know, and all this. And here's what they. That's what the Spanish were interested in. Uh -huh. This guy <coughs> reminds you of the Dutch Delft mm -hmm. ceramics, where they were copied, okay? And then the silver, okay? And this is the type, you get the crosses all the time, of the <coughs> galleons. And this exists. If you go to Bolivia, in Potosí, there is Casa de la Moneda. That is the mint. That's where they minted the uh, silver coins, melted the silver into ingot for transportation to the Pacific. Who is that face? Who is that? It's a mascara. It's a sort of a joke. Oh, yeah. I see. You notice. Maybe you do. Mm -hmm. Those are grapes oh, yeah. and wine. Oh. So he's saying, go ahead and take the silver. Oh. Enjoy it, you know. Mm -hmm. They're not telling you what comes before there, okay? Mm -hmm. There it is. It's really a nice building. Mm -hmm. It's still very much up. Mm -hmm. Interior, kind of an Andalusian motif, okay? What period would that have been? We're talking in the 1500s, 1500 through, I'll give you some detail on that now. There it is, take the silver, go ahead, okay. <laughs> this is the production peaked somewhere around here from 1500 to 1600 and then it declined. But it didn't because then they discovered silver mines in Mexico. And some of those are still in production. Same system. You get a slaves, you go down there, go to Acapulco, send it across, and you get porcelain back. No. Mexican silver emission. All destination, they go up to. See, this is when the Bolivian was and then it went down, and then they discovered silver in Mexico, and they got the same thing, and it went up. This is 1781. So that discovery actually prolonged the Spanish Empire some 50 years when it should have collapsed before then. And then we're coming into Leslie mining. And we go to sugarcane, sugarcane. We already touched a little bit on sugarcane, but didn't really go in detail on how involved slavery is with it. So let me begin here. Okay, books, lots of books written about. And it should be so, because it's really pivotal to understand uh, slavery. Oh, there's a course tomorrow on the pre-7, the, the U.S. before the uh, revolution. And the guy made some statements that are absolutely wrong. He claims that sugar was produced all around the Mediterranean and so on. That's not true. Mm. No. But that's his problem. <laughs> that's his problem. You're right. He says it started, so you believe it. Well, correct. 
right. Uh, sure, it was available. I mean, the Arabs had obtained it from techniques that they learned from the Hindus. Okay, so they have. Okay, but as far as we're concerned, we have Madeira, the Canary Island, Cape Verde Island. Initial production outside Europe was here. In fact, to be specific, right here, the island of Saint Tomé in the Guinea Gulf. I've been there, but it's uh, supposed to be wonderful land. The temperature is perfect here in the tropics now. Lots of rain and so forth. Excellent for what? Portuguese. This is sugarcane land. And their first haciendas, fazendas, was in this place. Okay. That place. They, didn't, they didn't grow sugar on the mainland? Main I'm sorry? Part. They didn't grow sugar on the mainland, only on the islands? They did in Malaga and Spain. They did have, the Portuguese did not grow sugar cane in Portugal itself. Mm -hmm. But the production in Spain, in Malaga, which was a, inherited from the Arabs, was not very good. So they were looking for some, somewhere else. And uh, this idea for large-scale plantation style production, Line numbers, you could capture the slaves here, you say, and kind of have it replaced, so it made sense. But then Brazil came because of the Treaty of Tordesillas. Uh, Portugal was allowed some part of Brazil, the easternmost part of Brazil, and they did settle in Pernambuco. They started a trading post that then grew, and they started growing sugarcane. And that became very, very important. So they, they moved, literally moved from here to Pernambuco. And they started bringing in the slaves across it out. Money, that's all it was. OK. This is what the Caribbean looked in the 18th century, OK. Spain possessed the larger islands, Cuba, La Española, and Puerto Rico. Was not interested in the little bitty things. The, Portu the uh, English came and took Jamaica from uh, Spain. And Spain didn't even question that, because they said it's going to cost us a lot of money. It's going to get involved in fighting. We don't need that. You can have it. You know. But that had consequences, as you will see. Okay. North America. Really, there was not that much slavers, slaver selling in the North America, that is the English colony, until cotton began. And that puts it in the early 1800s. Okay, late 1700, 1800, there was nothing. You had tobacco, you had indigo. They were not very profitable. Profit, you had to have to buy the slaves. Uh, also, there was a prohibition, 1807, on slave trade from our Congress. You could not go to Africa and do like, no, it was, but it did not prohibit the production of slaves in the homeland. So you could have slave trading. There were plantations whose whole pro profit was derived from producing the slaves in the South. Okay. All right. Some pictures. These are drawings. I think fairly, for probably fairly accurate. Now you're in the tropics. There's heat there and humidity. Just picture that. And you know what? I've got cane. It cuts you. Because the, it's, uh, it has a lot of silicon. And when it goes through, and you have to be covered up. Even. 
oh, as much as you can, or you're going to be a bleeding mess at the end of the day. Here's in Antiwa, 1823. You see the Lord here and the other guys. Mm -hmm. Go quickly. Close up. This guy, he, they always had one guy, could be white, could be black, and he was the uh, Mandamath. He's the one that kept everybody working and making sure that they had to do whatever they were assigned every day. And that included kids. See, that one is carrying water. Remember this song? Give me a little water, Susie. Every once in a while. That's what it was. This is Cuba. 1905, 1907, okay. And you live well. Yeah, you live there, you live well. You have your place, okay? This is the grinding who's done. We still see these things around. It's very simple, okay? Then you boil it. Boil the juice. And as it boils, it concentrates, and there's a point in which the sugar drops, okay? So then you have molasses and sugar, okay? A little right before the Civil War, this is a plantation. By now you have sugar mills organized. A great deal of the knowledge that we have in chemical engineering came from the, from the sugar mills. They were the first large scale, agriculturally speaking, uh, productions we had. Okay, there you go. This is the Dutch. They can't let their wind, their windmills go. So, okay, here. It's an actual picture from beginning of the last century. There's one today, Brazil. And if you were the owner of plantation, you had a good life, really, really good life. You didn't live in this city, but they had so much money that they just brought whoever they needed, musicians or whatever, to entertain you. You had a good life, you know, and cooks and so forth, you know. Well, music. But then it happened. No more, no more, no more. And it blew up. It blew up. 14th of July, you know the year. 1789, boom, for revolution in France. This was part of France, Haiti. It resonates. The slaves get the news. How oh, they got the news, they always did. Francois Macalin It's a Buddha priest, born in Africa, raised in Haiti. It's in He's given the instrumental, he was instrumental, he said, hey, we have to put up with this, okay, all right? Then Bookman, they had a meeting in Boacayman, there's the alligator woods. It's a Buddha ceremony. In there, uh, the Buddha priest and priestess it says, you can go out and get rid of this problem. That's the way it has to be. And they did go out immediately. They didn't wait. They went over and go out and did this. And that. Military now. Remember, these people, every day, they were cotton cane. So they were very good with the machete. Mm -hmm. okay. 
and some of their play, play scenes were practicing against each other to see who was the best fighter. This is the people that say no more. That's it. Okay. But after they rebelled, how did, what did they do? How did they, how get, did they organize themselves? Yeah, I'll, I'll, get, I'll get into that. Okay. These are from the period, and of course, there are drawings, and then some kind of romanticized view of what a battle is like. It probably was very horrible. Uh, today in Saint Domingue, they have Le Marron and Cogne de Saint Domingue. You see, like you have the unknown soldier, they have a rebel, the rebel were called Marron. And this is a, an unknown Marron, so there is a statue to them. I'm saying this because it's, it's built into the history and culture of Haiti. All of this is, you know, and rightly so. Okay. Then there is Nappy. Okay. This is to Saint Louis too. He was, these two, organized. They realized that the people, the slaves they had, <clears throat> were very good, and that they all needed, as far as fighting, they were, all they needed was regulation, get some military training, which they had, and then they were ready for anybody. Well, Nabi didn't like that. Come by. They considered themselves part of the French Revolution. The French and Paris, were we here too? We're not going to put up with this monarchy stuff. Not accepted wholly by the French, because some of them had plantations in Haiti. War between free slaves against planters and others ensued, so they cleaned that up. But there was more. There's Jamaica, and in Jamaica there is the English, always on, on the prey. They're weak now, so we can actually send some good troops over there and uh, take care of Haiti, and it becomes cotton and sugar cane for us. Mm -hmm. well, See, all of this. Yeah. We know Marie Antoinette got chopped. Okay. Got Up comes, copied from, a lot of it copied from our Bill of Rights, which they actually acknowledged that they wanted to have something like the Americans had, you know. And when you look at it, it has 16 articles. Very simple. Here's the French here. Men are born and remain free and equal rights. Mm -hmm. Sec fourth, liberty considered in anything which does not harm others. Very simple. Okay. Any society in which the guarantee of rights is not assured, nor the powers, separation of powers, determined has no constitution. Mm -hmm. In other words, we don't accept it. That's it, those three articles. But the French Revolution did not revoke slavery. No, they allowed it. Uh, explicitly, slave opera in Saint Domingue in the Haitian took inspiration from the document, anyway, because that was available to them. So that. All right, here it comes. To send the Louvre to you turned out to be a great military man. One of those born that way. And the English, as I said, they said, this is an opportunity. The one over there, he beat them. He absolutely destroyed them and not in guerrilla war or anything, in formal military manner. Mm -hmm. And the best general they had was this guy, right over here. 
yellow fever. But you see, this leaves at a level of resistance. Sickle cell anemia but gives you a resistance uh, that the Europeans didn't have, unless the European had been, you know, for some time. In. Okay. Napoleon said he just couldn't take it. We're not going to have the slaves telling us what to do and so on. So he sent 40,000 Europeans under the command of his brother-in-law, who he hated. He hated his brother. And uh, Charles Victoire Emmanuel Leclerc. Okay. Say you are in Lyon, France, or something like that, and they bring you here. It's quite a shock. So you have these two left as the leaders of the Haitian Revolution Jean Jacques Salle Saline and Henri Christophe. on the invading French force. And then yellow fever, okay. 24,000 dead, 8,000 sick and fighting from yellow, yellow fever. Uh, Nappy said, I don't want anything to go with the Americans. Goodbye. <laughs> and then he, he took off, you can have it. <laughs> okay. Union makes the force. That's there. They didn't end there. They didn't end there. You see, the Haitians honestly believed that they were Frenchmen, as good as any born in France. And therefore, when the motherland, France, was having trouble, they were ready to help. And they sent military men across. This one. Okay. This is the one I told you was from white French noble and Marika said Dumas. Okay. This guy was fantastic. Napoleon loved him. Handed him whole fronts, because he never missed, he never failed. And one of those uh, military that enjoy officers getting into the action. So much so that in the battles against the Austrians in northern Italy, the Austrian called them der Schwarzer Teufel, the black devil, because he, I already mentioned, he's a descendant, okay? So now we have, to me it's ironic, you have these slaves, okay, going to France to defend the revolution, and they did very well, in northern uh, France, but at the same time, they also get this. I mean, uh, half Haitian, and see, you know, the three musketeers and all that kind of stuff. But so now there is payback intellectually. Okay. Let's see. This Selene was killed. They would learn how, but he was assassinated. And then Henri Christophe was the other one that was left. He decided that the best thing would be to create an independent kingdom, you know, ruled by Haitians and so forth. If you looked around the world at that time, what models you had? The US Republic, not important enough. You looked at Europe, kingdoms all over the place. So if you wanted to have respect, you had to have a kingdom. So of course he was the king. But he always believed that the monarchies, Spain, England, and so on, would come to take Haiti back. So he had to be ready. So he built this, La Ferrière, which is still there, and basically, it was the people had to build it, and they got tired of it, so they killed him, and that was the end of the whole thing. <laughs> Nobody came. Nobody. Nobody was interested. Very sad. Okay. Uh, 
and survived, there were surviving French planters. And they came. Remember, Louisiana and France were very close. And they went to Louisiana. Here, people didn't know how to grow cotton or anything like that, or less sugar cane. So they started, these people went with their slaves, uh, went over to Louisiana, they got sugar cane there, and they started moving east. Alabama had nobody, there was nobody here. So they started the cotton thing. South Carolina and Georgia. But these are people that came originally, the French, that came originally from Haiti. You know, I've been here many years. Very few people know that. I'm sure the historians do, but they don't mention that. And that was critical for the development of the plantation system in the South. Well, I think we need to stop here. Okay. Uh, the course, uh, I plan to continue. There's, there's plenty left if, uh, if the powers that be allow it, I'll do the same thing. We got lots, lots to do. We haven't touched on the Aztecs or the Mayas or the Incas and so forth. And believe me, there's a lot of stuff in there too. Good. Crops and buildings and people and all kinds of things. Good. What? Good. Okay. Well, <laughs> anyway, some of this I told you when I started on the slavery thing. It, I had to really force myself to, to teach it because it's not, it's pretty miserable, yeah. the whole thing. Yeah. But on the other hand, I do believe that without slavery, the European would not have succeeded across in the Americas in the way they did. Okay, okay. so that, yeah. with that. Thank you. I'll Thank see you. you.